Well, as the title suggests, uh, we have a lot of bee species in California. Um, we're, we're the most speciose state in, the, in uh, the United States. And that has a lot to do with the fact that we have such a diverse environment here in California. We have everything. And uh, the bees take advantage of all these special places that we have in, in, the, uh, in the state. And that's why we have so many different species of bees that are um, adapted to the various places in which uh, we, we find them. So what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about the, uh, this, the group of bees overall. And, um, and then if you have some questions, please be sure to ask them and uh, we'll see what we have uh, in terms of interesting, interesting information that I can share with you. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, there's a little bit of an outline. We're going to talk about diversity, importance, decline, which, which is a major problem, how to help bees, our lab, what we do, and also how to garden for native bees. Next slide. So bees, wasps, and flies, what are some of the differences? Well, bees, first of all, have two pairs of wings. Uh, they evolved from wasps <clears throat> years ago. Wasps, of course, have two pairs of wings. And they can uh, sting, and uh, they're they're not really interested so much in plants. They're carnivores. Bees are vegetarians, which is a real major distinction right away. And flies, of course, some people confuse a fly with a bee, but flies have only one pair of wings. So that's one thing right away that you can use to distinguish them. Next slide. Uh, this is the anatomy of a bee: head, thorax, and abdomen, and um, the development of various parts of the body vary according to the type of bee that you're talking about. But this is just to let you know what a bee looks like. Uh, probably the thing to call your attention to right away is the fact that the legs and the wings are attached only to the thorax, not to the abdomen. So uh, we'll come back to this if we need to, but I think that um, we'll move on to the next slide. So how many bee species are there in the world? Well, California, as I mentioned, we have about 1,600, probably more. Uh, in the United States, we have 300, 3,600 species. Worldwide, we have 20,000 20, recorded species, but we think that there, this number may be as high as 30,000. We don't think all the species have been identified yet from places in the world like uh, parts of Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America. So we still have a lot of work to do. And uh, there's an awful lot of room there for other people to get involved. And that's beginning to happen. People are be really beginning to take an interest in the bees. So our bee lab is, you can see where it's indicated. And uh, we'll talk more about what all these bees are doing. Well, there's a lot of myths about bees. Um, all bees live in hives. Not true at all. Only the honeybee does. And the honeybee is not even native to North America. It's an old world species that's been brought over. Uh, bees sleep in their hives? Well, uh, honeybees, but native bees sleep anywhere. Uh, the interesting thing about bees when they sting you, uh, which is doesn't happen very often, but when a honeybee stings, uh, it dies. Now, when other bees sting, they don't die. They can mul sting multiple times, but the sting is usually much less with a native bee compared to a honeybee. Bees live a long time. Well, some bees live several months. Other bees live just a matter of a few weeks. And um, some, some people think that only female bees can do the pollinating. Actually, male bees do it as well. Pollination really is the act of contamination uh, of pollen being spread around by bees. So even something doesn't look like it's much of a, um, a flower visitor. If it has pollen on its body, and it's moving around from flower to flower, and some of that pollen gets distributed to the stigma of the flower, then you have pollination. All bees make honey. Not true at all. <laughs> In North America, the only bee that makes honey is the, is the um, honeybee. When you get into other parts of the world, like in Latin America, uh, the stingless bees make honey. Not as much, but they make a small amount of honey. So there are honey makers uh, outside of the United States besides the honeybee. Next slide. Well, we have generalist and specialist bees. Some bees specialize on certain flower types and some bees are generalists. They just take anything that comes their way. And what they're really after is pollen, nectar, 
And um, some are very fussy about the way they select. So uh, you have to know a little bit about the bee. And once you begin to watch bees, you begin to realize that you see certain bees doing the same kinds of things every day on certain flowers. And then you begin to realize that you've got spe a specialist bee or perhaps a generalist bee. Next slide. I'm going to go through the, the various kinds of bees that we have, groups of bees. Not going to say much about them because there's just too much information to spread around. But there are bees, for example, like the andrenid bees, which are the mining bees. They, are only, they only appear in, in the spring months of the year and then they disappear for the rest of the year. That is, they, they, have, they do their thing, they, get, they reproduce, and then they, uh, then they sit, sit in their pl various places where, the, uh, where they uh, prefer to over winter. Next slide. Uh, Apis mellifera, the honeybee's always around, but this is, you look at the bee, you can tell right away that this is a honeybee, and those of you who maybe deal with honeybees re recognize what it looks like. And they, they don't all look like this. Some people say, well, you know, I have a bee that looks much lighter in color, and others that look darker in color. So these come from different hives, and uh, but they're all the same species, Apis mellifera. Now, the African honeybee, let me go back here a second. The African honeybee is just a variety of Apis mellifera. So, um, this bee occurs in, in now in the United States, in the southern United States, where it's warmer. But um, it came over, first of all, from um, escaped hives in Brazil. And then it came moving up the way into uh, other parts of Central America, then into the United States. But... It's also a honeybee. In fact, it's very difficult to tell them apart unless you do some really careful analysis of the, of the biology. But Apis mellifera scutellifera is, uh, is the name of the African bee. And now most of the bees are, are, that we have that have gotten into the United States are Africanized. That is, they've mated with the, the local bees and they produced a, um, a kind of a hybrid. Next slide. Well, there are bumblebees that are really common, and bumblebees are really interesting because we have a, a number of them out right now. And we have this one on the left is a very common bee. You find it uh, on a lot of different plants, and especially on your California lilac. And the bee on the right side is another bee that's very common. And uh, you see this one commonly on poppies. So we have 27 species of uh, bumblebees in California, and they're beautiful. They're hard to... They're not always easy to tell apart. Uh, you need to work with a, a, a key, or that is a, um, a description. But um, they also make a kind of honey, but it's not um, it's not like honey that you can you can use commercially. It's honey that they they make for themselves. Uh, they're social, um, and uh, most of the bees in the in California are actually solitary or slightly social. But uh, the solitary bees is the, is, the, is the number one type of, of um, behavior that bees have. So bumblebees are really interesting, and they're easy to watch, and they're large and fluffy, fuzzy, and um, they're really quite, quite nice to have around your garden. Next slide. Uh, about half of the bumblebee species are endangered, however. So this isn't something that you have to keep in mind. And, you know, we're very worried about bees in general, but bumblebees in particular, about half of them are endangered. So worldwide, we have about 250 species of bees, 46 in North America, and 27 of these are in California. So we have a lot of bumblebees here in California, and uh, we're really worried about um, steps that need to be taken in order to make sure these bees are conserved. Well, a lot of insects are, are actually declining, and this is a real worrisome uh, aspect of our, our profession, and that is, what do we do about bees when they, they continue to decline? And, you know, what are we, what are we looking for in order to change this, the, uh, the formula here and get the bees active again and, and uh, reproducing and, and get their numbers up? We'll talk more about that as we go on. Next slide. Uh, this is just a few more examples of bees. The, the bee on the left is the one you see really commonly right now. And if you need to look at it and uh, identify it, 
Look at the face of the bee. It's yellow. You can't see this real well with this particular image, but it's called the yellow-faced bumblebee, and it's very flies around very commonly, um, and visits a lot of different flowers. The other bees are a little bit not quite as common. The California bumblebee, Bombus californicus, is is a little bit less common. But the one on the right side, Bombus melanopigus, is very common right now on things like um, ceanothus, California lilac. Next slide. Now here's a bunch of small bees. Um, not all bees are large. <laughs> this is a small bee, about half an inch in size and a very slender body, but it's a real in effective uh, pollinator. And it occurs in a lot of different areas and it also has a wide variety of hosts. And it um, is a generalist. So we have 13 species of these in California and a lot of these, this particular bee group, um, are good pollinators of agricultural crops in California. And we always have to spend time with the, with the growers and tell them a little bit about this little bee and show them pictures and also bring specimens so that they can see what these bees look like. Next slide. This is a sunflower bee. If you ever uh, looking at sunflowers at this time of the year, we're get, gonna get a lot of sunflowers pretty soon. And if you look at these little fuzzy bees flying around, this is the sunflower bee in the genus Diadasia. Next slide. And then we have the longhorn bees. These are really interesting. Um, this is another group of bees. And this is the male. They have long antennae. The females have much shorter antennae. But the, female, the males have these long antennae and they're used to um, identify uh, um, the plants as well as identify where the females are. So these are really, um, these, are, these are sensory structures that the bee has. And they're very easy to see on things like cosmos. When you begin to see the large cosmos flowers in your garden, you'll see these bees commonly on the cosmos flowers, as well as on sunflowers too. Next slide. Now here's another group of bees that I think is really interesting. Uh, as I mentioned before, 1600 species of bees, they all have different biologies, all have different ecologies. This particular group of bees are cuckoo bees. That is, they're like cuckoo birds. They make their living by parasitizing other bees. All the, after they do all the work and provision the nest with pollen and nectar, this bee comes along and lays its eggs inside the nests of the, um, the primary bee. And eventually, the, uh, when the egg hatches, usually that little larva that hatches will kill the host bee larva, and then it'll take over the pollen. So we have a lot of cuckoo bees. They're not, they're not rare things. They're quite common, actually. This is one of them. Um, and you can notice that another identifying feature here is if you look at the body of the bee, you don't see a lot of hairs on it, especially on the legs. So these bees are designed um, primarily to take advantage of other bees. Next slide. Carpenter bees. This is something that bothers a lot of people. There's these big black bees that fly around and people get really excited about these bees. Uh, they're not quite they're not bumblebees because they don't have lots of, of yellow hairs on them like bumblebees, but they're big black and uh, people get a little bit afraid of them. They're nothing to be afraid of. I mean, bees have three things in mind that they're interested in and that's pollen, nectar, and sex, and you're not on that list. So um, here's a really good example of a bee that goes into a flower and it makes contact with the anthers and the anthers spread all the pollen on the back of the bee. You can see that very nicely here and it moves on from flower to flower and pollinates in the process. So the big black bee are really nice bees to have around and they're fun to watch. And whatever you do, if you really don't like those bees and you think that they're doing something harmful to your house or your barn or uh, whatever, uh, please contact me and I'll tell you ways to deal with them. So uh, whatever you do, don't, don't spray them. Uh, here's a bee that, this is a carpenter bee also. It's all black. It's a female. And what she's doing is robbing the flower. She's not going in legally into a flower and making contact with the, with the anthers and the, and the stigma. She's actually poking a hole in the base of the flower and sucking out the nectar. So this is nectar robbing. Now the valley carpenter bee also has, the female as I mentioned is black, and the male bee, on the other hand, is this little, is this bee on the left side. This is called the teddy bear bee. 
and uh, Valley Carpenter Bee, Teddy Bear Bee. And this is a lovely bee. This is a large bee. You can grab this bee. It doesn't sting. It doesn't bite. It doesn't like to be held, but we use it as a teaching tool when we deal with kids. And um, it's a really interesting bee. And people always ask me, once they get used to this bee, they realize it's not harmful, harmful, and it's just kind of a cute little thing to have. They say, well, what can I plant so I can get more of these bees in my garden? It's such a nice bee. And we tell them what kind of plants to plant, and, and we hope that they, they have the experience of having this bee come and visit their flowers. Okay, next. Okay, then we have these small bees. These are really tiny little bees. They're about the size of a, a little bit larger than a, cur a kernel of rice. But they're really common, and they're also very, um, very prominent at this time of the year. They're called the masked masked bees, and they have an inter a, very, a very interesting way of carrying pollen. They don't carry it on their legs or their or their underside of their abdomen like some of the leaf cutter bees. They carry it and they take it internally into a specialized uh, expansion of the digestive tract, which is called the crop, and then they go back to the nest and they regurgitate. The pollen into the nest hole where they're nesting. So this is a, a, another way of carrying pollen. Now this is a bee that I always like to ask people, have you seen the ultra green sweat bee? And the one on the right is what I'm focusing on, which is the one that's all green and it's a beautiful bee. Even the eyes are green. The male on the other hand is uh, got a striped abdomen, which is down below. And um, But this is the most common um, native bee in California and it's around most of the year and uh, it's an excellent generalist pollinator and um, I like to call attention to people uh, and ask them if they've seen this bee and more and more when I give presentations people are telling me oh yeah I've seen a bee and I didn't really realize it was a bee and I said yeah it's a bee so there it is it's a beautiful bee uh, these are really small bees. These are tiny bees. I'm not going to say too much about them. They're sweat bees. They get the name sweat bee because some of the bees will come on your arms uh, or expose parts of your body where you ha actually have uh, or you're sweating. And they'll actually um, dabble with the sweat. They want to take that sweat up and use it uh, for their own purposes. So that's why they're called sweat bees. And there's lots of them. Now this is the Anthidium species, wool carter bee. This is a bee now that's very common in gardens. And it's been introduced from Europe. And um, this bee is really interesting because it, it chases all the other bees. And if you get too close to it, some of my students claim that they've been hit in the forehead by this bee. It just bounces off their forehead. And um, But this bee is very territorial. That's what it's doing. It's play, setting up territories hoping to get a, um, an interaction with a female and mate with a female. But in the process, it chases everything. Right now, I have them in my backyard on foxglove, and they're just chasing every bee that comes in, except when a female comes in. And then they're much kinder until they approach the female to see if she's interested in um, having a little, um, little greater relationship. So this is um, the wool carter bee. Next slide. This is one of my favorite bees. This is an, a leaf cutter bee, and it's on an Asteraceae flower. And uh, if you notice, the underside of the abdomen is full of pollen. And that's what these bees do. They, they uh, get on top of a flower and they rub back and forth, and they carry the pollen on the, the bottom of the abdomen. Now this is in contrast to things like bumblebees and honeybees that carry it on their legs. But this is a beautiful bee. And um, this is one that you'll see soon in round gardens a fairly common bee but nice now leaf cutter bees do exactly what they're supposed to do they cut they cut leaves they cut flower petals they take them back to their nest and they they make a nest out of them and you can see what some of these um nests look like once they construct them they piece them together they have kind of a liquid material that they use that they kind of a saliva that they can fasten these pieces of leaf together to form um, a, a, a cell, a series of cells. and um, But to watch them do this this uh, thing about collecting bees is really, really very interesting. And they'll fly around with this piece of leaf till they get to the their nest, and you can watch them do all that, at least. And if you dig them up, you can actually uh, see these these uh, complete cells that they're, they're making 
out of uh, out of leaves, out of flowers. Next slide. And then we have the osmia, which is the mason bees. And these are bees that come out in the springtime only. And they're, uh, they have a round head, a round thorax, and mostly a round abdomen. And they're beautiful colors, dark metallic, and uh, they're solitary. And some of them nest with, uh, with mud, and some of them nest with chewed up leaves. And they also collect pollen on the underside of their abdomen. They're leaf cutter bees. And again, this is a one in springtime uh, that you'll see this bee. In fact, most of them now are, are passing. So uh, we're getting ready for the summer bees. Next slide. Well, the importance of bees. What we, we all know that what bees do, they pollinate. And 75% uh, of the flowering plants of the world rely on pollinators. And it's said that uh, about a third of, of the uh, food that we eat has been pollinated previously by a bee. So uh, bees are extremely important pollinators. And if we didn't have them, we'd be eating a lot of very dull foods. So bees are really essential for keeping ecosystems and agricultural systems and even your gardens uh, healthy. So bees are extremely important. We'll say more about this as we get into this topic a little bit more. Uh, one third of the food we eat is uh, pollinated by bees. So there's there's all sorts of ways in which the um, the bees are helping us and their importance. So uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go in. But there are some of these. Okay, well let's we'll, we'll talk about pollinator decline. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, pollinate, bees are, are declining worldwide, which is a real serious problem. Europeans are documenting more, more of this than we are in the United States, although we've documented it as well. Um, honeybees are declining, native bees are declining, and insects in general are declining. And there's a number of reasons for this, but we don't know all of the reasons. So um, there's some really serious issues involved with um, pollinator declines. In, in, in fact, it isn't just simply in temperate regions. Tropical regions also are, are showing declines in pollinators. But there are some things that you can do, and there are some reasons why pollinators are declining. We'll talk about that with the next few slides. First of all, we destroy their habitat. I mean, if you don't have habitat, you don't have a place to uh, reproduce. Uh, sometimes if the habitats are fragmented. So the bees have a harder time getting around. Um, pesticide use clearly is a problem. And uh, recently, you know, people used to ask us, well, what about herbicides? Are herbicides okay? And we kind of hemmed and hawed. But now we have some real solid evidence that things like Roundup, um, glyphosate, um, are impacting seriously bumblebees. And they have to be impacting the other bees as well. We just don't have all the studies in order yet. Climate change, for sure. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in just one second. There's introduced species that actually in, in invade uh, the environments of other species, the native species. And then you have this whole series of disease and mites, a uh, very big area that's also causing problems. But I want to get back to climate change for a second. Climate change, you know, in California, we have all these drought conditions that are that are taking place right now. And this is serious because this is changing the synchronization between flowering and the bee um, seasonality uh, uh, events. So when you have plants that don't flower on, on time and you have plants that flower uh, maybe less than what they, they did before, then the bees have to respond to that. And some of the bees can respond by actually holding over for a year, two years, three years sometimes. But some bees just don't have the food. If they don't have the food, they're not going to reproduce. So this is the reason why a lot of our research now has to do with how can we enhance the, the food sources of bees but artificially, in, in a sense, because we're, we, want to, we want to restore and we want to uh, change habitats so the bees have some food to, um, to forage from and also to live into. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. But climate change is a real problem. Next slide. So how do we help bees? Well, please don't use pesticides. <laughs> and there is no such thing as a safe pesticide. Uh, there are some things like if you have to use a little bit of soapy water to get rid of your aphids, that's probably okay. 
But pesticide use is really designed for one thing, and that's killing. And they kill not only the target, but they also kill all things like, like honeybees and all the other bees. If you can preserve native habitat, that's a good thing. Or if you can enhance native habitat, that's a good thing too. Um, and create pollinator gardens. Now this is a pollinator garden on the right side that we developed in the San Luis Obispo. When we first started, it had almost no native bees. After a year of work, uh, we got the number of native bee species up to 40. So you can actually, within a very short time, if you, if you um, develop these gardens properly, you can expect bees to inhabit uh, the gardens and you can document them. And we've been able to do that. And uh, we're now working with uh, agricultural areas to, to do the same thing. And I'll talk about that shortly. But please don't use pesticides. Well, our lab at Berkeley, uh, we've been at it for a number of years. And uh, first of all, I wanna show you the, on the left side, the left image, is our stock of um, native plants that we know are very good for bees. We have, we don't just put any plant out. We put out plants that we know are good for bees and we even know the groups of bees that'll come to those plants. Here's one of our large habitat gardens in the middle uh, in Southern California where we study avocado pollination. Every one of these plants, we know exactly the characteristics of the plant. We know exactly which bee species should be coming to them and we monitor these areas and we've been doing that for uh, since 2014 we started the work down there but this is shows you what a habit nice habitat garden looks like and then on the right side you'll see the, the little box of bees and uh, we show these to people and they say oh yeah this is neat they're kind of small blah 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 anyway the, the point that i'm getting at here is this is not adequate for us to communicate information about bees to people. So we're actually photographing a lot of the bees and we're putting these things into publications where people can see close-ups of the bees. It's not good enough just to see a little tiny bee. Every one of those little insects that you see on a, on a pin and a label, these are all bees. And of course, when you go to a farmer or grower and you say, <laughs> these are the bees that are in your, in your orchard or your, in your crop, and they go, oh yeah, this is very interesting. Well, we, we've also learned that this is not the way to do it. So we're actually spending more time developing large blow-ups and close-ups so people can see what these bees look like close up. And then we talk to them about bee stories. We tell them about the bees. So we're spending much more time with growers and also with urban people, telling them all about the uh, life, size, life cycles and the, 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 the situation with the with, with the bees in terms of their um, frequencies, in terms of their histories, if we know them, and their, their ecological relationships. Next slide. So gardening for native bees. Well, bees need food sources year round. And here's a beautiful garden um, in Brentwood, California, Northern California. And it's just full of bees and the more plants that you pack into these areas, especially plants that bees like, the greater the number of bee species and the greater abundance of bees overall that you will actually uh, experience. This is a wonderful garden. We, we pull out of here at least 50 species of bees just in this one garden. So bees need pollen for protein and they need nectar for the carbohydrates, uh, the sugars. And uh, this is what we think is one of the ideal um, goals to to achieve and that is a very diverse garden uh, which provides both food for the bees as well as habitat for nesting so one of the important things to recognize about bees is they're not all the same that means that they need different things at different times of the year depending on the species and the more diversity that you have in gardens the greater the diversity of bees that you'll be um, catering to in your in your garden. Next slide. So I'm going to show you some of the plants now that we like and uh, I also want to mention to you that um, we are bee centric. That is we we go with what the bees tell us that they like. So we're not hung up on native plants only. Uh, we know that they like native plants but we also know they like non-native plants. So that's the reason why we, we call ourselves bee-centric. California lilac on the left, this is Ceanothus. 
Manzanitas, very interesting uh, group of plants. Sometimes people don't realize how early these plants flower. They'll flower in the middle of December. And there are bees, bumblebees in particular, that will be there to pollinate them. Wisteria comes, this is an exotic, uh, but the large carpenter bees like this, this plant a lot. Pride of Madeira, the one on the right, is loaded with different kinds of bees. It comes from a, another part of the world, but we plant it because bees like it. Next slide. Buckwheat. These are native buckwheats on the left side. Uh, gum plant, native. Phacelia, native of Southern California, but also does well in Northern California. And uh, keep in mind, just because it's from Southern California doesn't mean that bees don't like it. They like it. Move it northward, and they'll use it. So uh, you just have to follow what, bee, what bees tell you to do. You should be listening to them. That is listening in the sense of watching them, and they'll tell you what they like. And that's what you ought to plant. Next slide. Lavenders. Oh, they love lavenders. Not particularly this one, but there's uh, one coming on right now that's just starting called Lavendula Provence. And they really like that one. Catnip. Uh, they like catnip. And they like sages, particularly the Brandigii sage, uh, which you can buy at m many of the uh, nurseries. So um, and once again, it's a mixture of natives and non-natives. Next slide. California poppies, really good for bumblebees and also good for some honeybees. And then there are some um, leafcutter bees that like this as well. And the common yarrow plant here, this is a native plant, um, uh, Achillea. Uh, this particular one is sort of okay. We like the one that's all yellow. The yellow one is really more, much more, um, much more attractive to bees. So once again, it's a matter of when you watch and see what the bees are doing, they'll tell you what they like, and then you should take action accordingly. Next slide. Okay, so uh, I've already mentioned that um, manzanitas are a real good flower for bees. And um, also this bee down here in the, the lower right, uh, this is the one that's got, look at the mouth parts of this bee. It can reach into the flower pretty well. And this is a bee that's common, believe it or not, on the Berkeley campus. And it comes out in springtime around, say, the gate. This is Habropoda. And uh, the grounds people always contact and they say, how can we kill this bee? It's all over the place. And they say, don't kill that bee. It's a beautiful bee. And it's, uh, it's, it's making a nest around, say, the gate. And they do it every year. They've been doing this for over 100 years that we've kept records on. So it, it's, a lot of what we do has to do with education. And uh, if we get a chance to talk to grounds people or urban people or whatever, we try to do that and educate them about what bees are there. But one thing you must, must keep in mind, and that is if you're going to do this, you have to have some visual aids for them so they can see these things and have some websites where they can go to get information. And that's where uh, communication with, uh, with groups of people, audiences, is really very important. Next slide. Oh, this is one of my favorite plants, Calandrinia, which is in full flower everywhere. We love this plant up north, northern California, a little bit lesser in southern California. But the bees love this plant. And uh, it's a really good plant, easy to grow. It's um, drought tolerant, produces beautiful flowers, which attracts a wide diversity of bees. And um, bumblebees like it, small carpenter bees like it. The nice thing about this plant is it flowers for a long time period. And it's easy to propagate. Just cut off a, a chunk of the, of the um, plant and put it into the ground, maybe with some rooting compound, and you got yourself a plant. So this is one of my favorite plants to um, recommend to people. We'll get flowers on this thing now until, excuse me, until probably November. Really good plant. Uh, Ceanothus, California lilac. This is a really nice plant. There's so many different varieties and no many, so many different species we have in California, and, there's, and the bees love this plant. This is a really good plant in springtime. Gumflower, we've already talked about this. Um, we've already talked about... Now, this is another one that's really nice. Sphyrousia, um, and This is the globe mallow. This is a really interesting Southern California species, native. 
and uh, it attracts a lot of bees. It's a really good plant to plant in the ground. It's also very tolerant to drought, uh, but if you water it well, or water it moderately anyway, you'll get a big growth of plant of leaves and flowers like you see in this particular image. If you don't water it so much and you let it take care of itself, which you can do, um, you'll find that um, the flowers will be more sparse and there won't be as much leafy vegetation as well. Uh, so this is a good chance for me to say something also about not only the bees, but also if you're going to be interested in saving bees or monarchs or whatever, you should know something about plants. And it's amazing to me when I talk to people about how much they know about plants and how to the horticultural aspects of plants, how little people really know, except if you happen to be a really adamant gardener. And if you happen to be an adamant bee person, you'll know something about them. But a lot of people don't. But it's a good idea to find out about plants because that's the basis for their survival uh, in these environments. Ah, this is one of my favorite plants. This is Vitex from North Africa. And this is a plant that's only two years old, produces these beautiful stalks of purple flowers, and it attracts a huge number, a huge diversity of bees. And this thing, once it gets established, um, you don't need to water it anymore. And it'll grow, if you let it grow, it'll go to 20 feet easily, but you can prune it and you'll keep it to a nice size in your garden and you'll have flowers for months once it starts to flower, which is just about ready to start to flower now. And if you trim those old flowers off, you'll get a new crop of flowers. So this is a really nice plant to have. And once again, it's an, it's an exotic, North African, and it's becoming more and more popular now that people realize what, what it can do. This plant is only two years old, by the way. On our website, helpabee.org, um, we have a list of plants that we recommend, a little bit about their characteristics. And uh, for those of you who want to have some more uh, updates, you can always write to me. And uh, we're happy in my lab to provide information to people who uh, want to know a little bit more about what plants to buy. I mean, sometimes people say, well, give me your six best plants. And I say, no, I won't. I'll give you my, my top 20 plants. Because you, if people just want to have a plant that produces bees, uh, that's not that's not adequate. We think that people ought to be thinking about a habitat for bees, and that include, that's about at least a dozen species of plants. Twenty is better, but uh, we like to tell people to look at a list that you can produce in your yard and get some really nice flowering going, and you'll attract the bees. Next slide. Uh, water. You um, when you produce produce water for bees. This is mostly for honeybees, but there are bees that also take water and they use it to spit on the top of a dirt uh, clod or a dirt area where they, they need to soften up the dirt so they can dig a hole. So they actually, <laughs> they can actually take up water, spit it out and uh, work to work on that spot to, to dig a hole for making a nest in the, in the, in the soil. So um, a little bit of water really is very helpful, but most of the time you're going to get honeybees into the water. You also have to worry about uh, bees drowning in water. So you want to have a, some floating material like wood uh, so that the bees don't, dr don't drown. So it's a good idea to be, be smart. Providing shelter. Well, people always ask and more and more people want to know, how can I set up these bee hotels or bee condos? Um, and my, my response to that is, yes, you can do that. But in addition to the bees that you'll attract, um, you're going to be attracting other things. You're going to be attracting things like um, wasps that like to make nests in these little holes. You're going to be attracting earwigs. And you're going to be attracting things like crickets and a few other things, sometimes ants. So one of the things that happens here is that People say, well, how, what, how often do I have to clean these out or what should I do? And uh, we, we, we'll give them a long list of things that they ought to be thinking about before they take the responsibility of putting these nests up. Because once you do this, you're going to be attracting insects in there. And if you're not careful, some of these insects are going to die on you or you maybe you misuse the, the, um, the materials. And you're going to want to um, uh, take 
be concerned about the fact that it isn't just bees that you're going to collect. You're going to collect other things as well. Now, in the tropics, when we use these, we have to be really careful because we have bigger holes that we use, and we can actually get katydids and crickets, and even little frogs will come into some of our, our bee condos in, in the tropics. So you have a responsibility of, of attracting organisms that come into these places, and you um, should be thinking about that. It's, it's, it, isn't as simple, it is not simple just to be putting out bee condos and thinking that you're going to be doing a lot of good. You have to be careful. We were at about quarter till, Gordon. So. Okay. Well, I think uh, if anybody has some questions, we can start a few questions. Okay. Wonderful. Um, we do. We have a, a handful of questions. So um, <laughs> one that came in earlier um, from a email um, is that we have a small tree with small flowers in the spring and every year during this blooming period, the tree is literally thousands of honeybees enjoying the flowers. My wife and I Love to stand under the tree in the spring and just listen to the buzzing, except this year there were a slightly lesser number of bumblebees instead of the usual honeybees. I couldn't spot any traditional honeybees at all. Comments. Sorry, I can't identify the tree or the specific bee type. So you have a comment on that? Well, um, unless I know the tree, um, it's pretty hard to comment and also um, <laughs> When I plant things and, and the bees come in, I'm, I'm always curious about which bees come in. Of course, we can identify them. We now have keys to identification of a lot of the bees. And um, if you get honeybees and bumblebees coming in, um, that's good. If they're declining, uh, that's not so good. So um, it's hard to give you a really good answer to that question, except that to enjoy it. I mean, I, I just think that people... Uh, you know, are a little bit more me too mechanical and they should really be thinking about enjoying some of the uh, things that they're actually seeing. I spend a lot of time watching the bees in my backyard, for example. Yeah. Um, here's a question about um, carpenter bees that a pesticide company sp sprayed for carpenter bees, which had made a home in the eaves of my cottage. I hope Dr. Frankie will tell us how to deal with them or that he will provide an email address for okay. us to ask him pri privately. Okay, so first of all, I like carpenter bees. Secondly, we don't know of any houses or barns or places like this have ever collapsed because of carpenter bees. If you don't like carpenter bees, then one of the things that we recommend that you do, or two things actually, um, that you plug the holes with steel wool, or you can also put up extra boards alongside of the places where they're boring. And then once they bore into those, those, hole, those uh, pieces of wood that you put up there, you can take the wood someplace and, and put it out in, in a wild area and let the bees go. Uh, we do not recommend using pesticides. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just old mentality of killing things that, that seem to be in your environment that, you, that humans don't like. So I like steel wool. People have used steel wool commonly. The other thing, too, is that um, they don't make that many. They're not that many holes that they make. I mean, if, if, what if you have a half a dozen bees buzzing around your, your, um, your home or your, your, your wood? Uh, watch them. They're fun to watch. I know that sounds a little crazy and it bothers people. But on the other hand, if you really are bothered, please use steel wool. Don't use chemicals. That's a great tip. I hadn't heard that. That's wonderful. Um, here's another question. I'm living in transitional pygmy forest, northern coast of California, and have not seen many bees at all, though there must be some. Are there plants that you know of which could survive this acid soil alternating between arid and standing water conditions, which could provide a food source for local bees? Well, we could probably work up a list. Um, I'm just trying to think of what might, I know the area real well. I used to work up in that area a lot. Um, the lilacs are one possibility. Poppies are another possibility. And there, there are other lists, there are other plants that I would have to dig out of my files that probably would be helpful. If they could contact me, yeah. I can actually send them some information. Yeah, we'll um, provide Dr. Frankie's uh, email address, which is um, gwfrankie at berkeley.edu. Um, but we will put that in the um, chat for you to access. Um, 
I think we've gone through this, but do you have a list of pollinators and bees, uh, the bees drawn to? So we, that you're, you showed you your website um, and also can um, contact you directly for that information. Yeah, and there's also a really nice publication that's put out by the um, uh, UCANR uh, publications at Davis. It's on the common bees, beautiful photographs that we've taken common bees of California gardens and their host plants. And they still have a lot of these available. Uh, you just write to Davis, A N R U C A N R, uh, and they'll, or you can write to me and I can, I can also tell you how to get in touch with them. It's a really nice little flip card booklet. We designed it mainly for students and teachers, but everybody likes it because the photographs are so high quality and so easy to uh, recognize the bees from these images. We took the best and the most common bees and put them into this little booklet. So it's really, it, sits in, it fits really nicely in your front pocket or your shirt. That's wonderful, especially with identifying on the go uh, different things. That's yeah. great. We can get um, people connected with you for that information. Um, I'm, I'm planting for all year round flowering. Can the slides be made available to viewers? And I, I believe we can um, make these slides available to folks, uh, Dr. Frankie. Is that okay? Um, yeah, I, I, the only problem I have is that um, the, the, our bee photographer, he doesn't want to have any of these photographs show up someplace else without his name on them. Of course. Okay. So I think, I think the best thing to do is for people who want to have a year round flowering. I mean, we can, we can provide a really nice list of plants. If people contact me, we actually have a list available right now of things that we use in Northern California or Southern California that we can provide for them okay. that would, would be good for year round uh, nesting. But uh, I, I don't think we ought to let this, this particular slideshow go out without the, con without the permission of, the, of our photographer, who's a, who's a really good photographer. Yeah, impressive, really impressive. Sure, we, absolutely, we can adhere to that. Um, is Calendrinia also known as rock purslane? Calendrinia is, um, I forgot the rather common name for this, but um, I don't think that's right. Um, Calendrinia, I think it's called Calendrinia grandiflora or spectabilis. I forgot what it is. It's very commonly you know, found in literature. It's also in the Sunset Garden book. By the way, that's a very good book to get in, in, in your hands <clears throat> to give you some good uh, in, in, uh, um, horticultural information on the plants. Um, Calendrinia you just pull up a piece of that or go to the nursery and 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 buy this and and um it, it you you'll find that it, it just grows beautifully and quickly that's great um thank you for that um please tell us what plants not to plant are rhododendron okay for native bees bad for honeybees or oleander bad for honeybees okay for natives Oh, please don't plant or oleander. <laughs> Everything about that plant is poisonous. <laughs> if you look at the, the, the liquid that comes out of a leaf, it's just terribly poisonous. Um, I don't know this plant. I don't know why people, I think the reason why people plant it is because it's green and it grows, but it, it's the worst plant. Please don't plant oleander if you, unless you absolutely are just, you know, hard up. Um, and any other on the list that do you also are you able to provide sort of a not to plant list? Well, I never, yeah, I can do that. I've never done that, but I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, um, that sounds but, like it could be helpful. <laughs> yeah, well, it could be. Uh, there's, there's other plants that, you know, it, the thing about plants is that each one has a different set of characteristics. So if you're looking for plants, for example, some people say, well, what do you, what do you think about, um, let's see, let me give you a good one. Um, salvia mellifera, which is um, black sage, uh, beautiful plant, but it grows and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it takes over a lot of area. So I always tell people, you should know what kind of space that you have in, in mind if you're going to plant something like that or something like coffee berry. It gets bigger and bigger all the time. So I, I always think that people have to let me know what their goals are with a garden and what kind of space they have and where they are in Northern California, Southern California, or where are they? And then we can provide them with a really nice list of plants if they want that. 
Okay, great. Well, they, the questions keep coming. Um, the um, question is, how do you keep mosquitoes out of the bee water source? Oh, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. <laughs> okay. We'll just, we'll just, that's okay. Uh, we'll move on then. How do solitary bees reproduce without a hive? Oh, that's a big one. I should have put another slide in there. I could have told you very nicely about that. What happens in the springtime is the bees come out and they find uh, the plants that they like. They mate, and then the female goes off and makes a nest someplace. And then when she makes a nest, she dies. The male dies too. And for the next uh, seven, eight, nine months, that bee is not around because they're 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 holed up in a in a in a ground someplace. Or seventy percent of all the the bees in California are ground nesters, by the way, or they're in some kind of a tree hole. They make their brood in there. The adults die, and then the uh, the, the subsequent uh, generation is all new bees. So this is what what happens with with bees that. Um, um, nest and and uh, do their thing in the in the springtime. I'm just going to stop sharing the slides for a second so I can get the questions, and I'm going to put um, a spotlight on. Um, let's see. So it's just you. Okay. So um, quantitatively, what are the major foods humans can consume that depend on bee pollination? Oh. Well, there's so many. I mean, all the fruits and all, many vegetables. Um, if you think about stone fruits, think about palm fruits. These are would be things like peaches, apricots, uh, pears. These are the kind of fruits that um, depend heavily on pollinators. Um, and then there's lots of other things like tomatoes. If it wasn't for pollination by, by bumblebees, we wouldn't have tomatoes. So there's a whole series. I mean, if somebody wants a list of all these plants, they can write to me, but those are some of the ones that come to mind right away. Squash, we have, we have squash bees. They're designed, they're specialists on, on squash flowers. <laughs> and uh, without the squash bees, uh, you're not gonna get squash reproduction and you're not gonna get melons and you're not gonna get a lot of things that we, we take for granted that are, that are just right there and they're being pollinated on a regular basis by these little guys that we call bees and they're out there doing the job working um i see yeah robin mitchell asks i see yellow faced bumblebees flying low to the bare dirt in my garden what are they looking for and when when the when the ground when the ground is dry uh well probably the, the 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 bee that you're probably looking at is the yellow faced bee and that's they nest in the ground and they're looking for probably a place to nest or they're looking for the hole that they um, that they normally use. Uh, sometimes these are holes made by rodents or they could be made by some other kind of animal. And uh, they're they're probably looking for to go find their way back into the hole where they came from. Helpful. Um, let's see. Um... Nico asks, was, um, was the stingless melipona bee ever at home in California? Well, this is a very interesting question. We actually have an, uh, an introduction of the, of the stingless bees in San Jose someplace. And we just, I, every once in a while I contact my, my colleagues. These, these bees came from tropical America, by the way. They were introduced. And um, apparently they have been established, but nobody's followed up on on their um what they're doing so every once in a while i have to contact my my friends in the usda and they tell me what's happening and it doesn't seem to be much happening because people aren't commenting on them but the meloponine bees the, the stingless bees are really common in in uh, tropical america they're they're common in other places in the world as well and they do make honey um and they, they're stingless. They get their name stingless because they, they don't sting. Um, and they're really a nice bee. They make beautiful little nests. And um, they're really nice to, to know about when you live in the tropics, for example. But they're, they're, not, uh, they're not really part of our biota yet in, in California or in the United States. They may well be in the future as climate change takes, takes hold and, and things start moving northward. 
There's a quite two couple questions about mulch. Um, does new mulch cover up bee homes and prevent bees from emerging next year? And then another question about the spaces for bees. So um, can you speak more about mulch? Well, the mulch, um, years ago I was watching, uh, <laughs> I was watching um, um, some programs mm -hmm. and um, there was a program called March, well, actually, you know, basketball, March Madness. And then I started thinking at the same time about mulch madness because some people were using so much mulch in their gardens, they were covering up all the dirt. And my thinking was they're covering up opportunities for bees to make nests in that dirt. On the other hand, I always say to myself and say to other people, if your neighbor is messy and they're not, you know, putting mulch around, then they'll maybe they'll provide the nest space for that you need or they'll come in from other areas. But if you can, don't cover up your soil with thick layers of mulch because the bees can't get through it and they can't nest in that dirt that's underneath the mulch. Well, that lines up well with the question of how to create, um, how do you create um, good nesting opportunities for bees? So um, can you comment any further other than the, um, the mulch? Not using well, in the case in the case of nesting bees, uh, the soil nesting bees, we don't really have a lot of good um, information yet about the practical aspects of taking advantage of that that particular habit. But in the case of bee condos or bee hotels, we do have a lot of uh, information for people if they want to want to take on that uh, problem. Uh, but I also I also also like to caution people. If you're going to create bee, bee habitats or bee condos or hotels, be aware of the responsibility that you have because you're going to attract all kinds of other things besides, besides bees. You're going to attract really interesting wasps that make nests in, the, in those little holes. You're going to attract earwigs, which of course nobody likes. Uh, you're going to attract sometimes ant nests. And um, you can even attract small crickets. And also... In these drought times, uh, when the bees come in and make nests in these these um, hotels, they may not nest for the first, they may not emerge the first year or the second year or the third year. They can hold over. They have a capacity for holding over under drought conditions. In California, the bees are adapted to drought. Uh, they can hold over. So if you're going to be thinking that I'm going to put some bee, bee hotels up and next year I'm going to get a crop of bees, it may not happen. They may still be in that, in those uh, little hotels there, for another year or two or three. So, it is not a simple matter of setting up bee condos. The other thing about bee condos is people say, "Well, I'm going to flood the area with all these bee condos." And well, if you do that, you're also going to attract the parasites and predators that feed on bees. So you you have to be careful. Uh, I always recommend that hey, people have small investments or small um, condo uh, complexes, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe not more than about 30 or 40 holes. And people always ask the whole size. Well, one quarter, three sixteenths and five sixteenths are the ones that we use. But I don't use them in big, big numbers. Like sometimes when people want to cover a wall with all these holes. <laughs> That's a bad idea. Great. Well, um, it's so nice to have you available and your team to answer questions. Um, we have many more questions, but it is four after two. Um, I'll take a couple more if you can, if you'd like, Dr. Frankie, to um, just answer those, and then we can we can. Yeah, we can we can do a few more. Okay, and whoever I know, some people may need to leave, have some other obligations. But for those of you that would like to stay, we'll stay a little longer because these questions are wonderful. Terry asks, carpenter bees love my pineapple sage, but earlier this year, I noticed honeybees on my pineapple sage. They appeared to be robbing nectar as well. I've never seen this before. Are they cutting new holes or using the holes previously made by carpenters? Big question mark. Yeah, usually what happens is the honeybees are smart, uh, at least to some extent, and they will use the holes made by carpenter bees. So they look for these holes uh, they, they're not good at making holes. Carpenter bees have mouth parts that are designed for cutting and, of course, chewing into wood so they can pick a, poke a hole really quickly into a base of a flower and take out the nectar. 
Interesting. Um, same with, are the carpenter bees damaging to wood construction such as decks, ramadas, et cetera, or is that a myth? And I know you touched on that, but maybe you want to just drive that home one more time. Well, you know, here again, I think it's a matter of people to get worried about large black bees buzzing around and making holes. Uh, personally, I wish they would do this in my house because I'd watch them. And if I got tired of them, I would plug up the holes with the steel wool and I'd make sure that they were not around when I did that. So uh, it's a matter of personal preference and understanding that this is what bees do. This, they need to nest. They need a place to nest. We've taken over their places. We've taken away the wood, the habitat, and uh, they see these beautiful boards sticking out and they make holes underneath those boards and they make, they make their nests there. And if you were to open up those holes, you'd find out that there's maybe six, seven small cells that have young bees that are developing. Well, like you said, no no building has ever collapsed uh, due to the due to these uh, nesting and drilling bees. So yeah, and, they're, and maybe they're maybe they're active one year uh, in a, in a in a place, and then the following year they may not be, or they may be active for two years, and then then they won't be back to after after that. So we, we don't know all of what motivates a bee and and what motivates them to do this or that or find particular places, but we do know. That if you put pieces of wood up next to where the holes are, they may they may go into those holes and they may use them. And then you take the wood away, and then at the same time you may want to plug up the old holes with steel wool, and then um, sort of takes care of it. If if you like carpenter bees, which I do. <laughs> um, what was the name of this um, Sathergate bee? Uh, it's called Habropoda. Habropoda depressa. And every year in the springtime, these bees fly around and they fly around, particularly there's a, there's a small um, um, live oak there that's surrounded by dirt and a little wall. And the bees are flying around and people think, oh, these bees are gonna cause some trouble. Turns out all those bees are males. And the males are waiting for the females to come out of the ground so they can mate with them. And they're not interested in you at all. So the say the gate, this is this is something entomologists every year we have to deal with this this question of the uh, Habropoda um, Habropoda depressa um, insects there, which I think is a great resource. I mean, it's every every year we go up there and we say, oh look at those bees, they're really cool, and they're flying around, and all they're doing is is you know, they're interacting with other males, they're waiting for females to come out of the ground. Some of these bees are so aggressive, and some of these females are so eager to mate that they'll release pheromones before they actually emerge. And then the males will ju jump down the holes and try to mate with them before they even come out. So um, it's quite an interesting uh, bee. And we talk about this bee a little bit in our some of the literature that we produced as well. Well, I can't wait to go and, and take a look now that you've made that, um, made us aware of that. Um, at, what about wasp nests and what's the best way to deal with those? Is that something you can answer or? Wasp nests, well, it depends on what kind, if they're ground nesters or if they're making nests in your attic or what kind of where they are. Um, first thing I can say about wasps is that people think that all wasps are bad. This is not true at all. Most wasps are highly beneficial. And they also, um, they manage other, other insects that we don't like. So they're very good and very beneficial overall. There's only a few wasps that give us trouble, like yellow jacket wasps. And um, there's ways to deal with those wasps that are that are pretty benign, which I think is pretty interesting because you can actually attract them, not too much, but you can attract them away from your 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 barbecue if they're not if you don't have a big nest nearby. Okay. And one of the ways that you can do that is <laughs> it's very simple. I mean, my, my father taught me this years ago. And I don't know where he learned it, but other people have known about this for years. You take a container of water, a small basin of water, you put a stick over the top of the water and you attach a piece of meat to the underside of that stick. And the wasps come flying up and they land on that stick and then they, they roll around underneath to get out that piece of, um, that piece of uh, meat. And you have the, the water level uh, come up almost to where the, 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 um, the meat is. And of course you, have, you put soapy water and the bees don't have enough sense to, or the wasps don't have enough sense to climb back up to where they came from. So they try to fly out. And if you fly out, you're going to hit the soapy water. And when you hit the soapy water, you're done. You're finished. You're a goner. That's and you can, 
you can collect. The nice thing about this method is it uh, there are attractants that you can put out that will attract wasps, but you don't want to attract wasps. You just want a benign way to collect them. And this is a good benign way to collect. You can collect hundreds of wasps if you use this technique. And you don't have to worry about drawing them in from some place where you're going to get air, all the neighbors coming in as well. You don't want that. You just want to get those guys that are local in your area. So you may not get them all, but you'll get an awful lot. There's some great, a great idea here to have a sign put up at Sather Gate to inform the uninformed about the bees um, that they're I think not. We give them, I think we should name that bee the Save the Gate Bee. I think <laughs> that would be <laughs> make it a. <laughs> yeah, what I didn't tell you about is the is the green the metallic green sweat bee that we uh, you showed you pictures of earlier. Yeah. We actually gave that a common name. We we actually years ago we called it the ultra green sweat bee. And the reason is because it's such this exoskeleton is so beautiful and so green uh, that we just said, you know, this is the well, what can we call this thing? We say, well, let's call it the ultra green sweat bee. That'll that'll do it. It's not an official name because there are official common names, but we don't pay any attention to those anymore because people make up their own names as they go along anyway. So um, besides it's too much paperwork. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to take uh, one final question and encourage those that didn't get any questions that they're answered, please to email uh, Dr. Frankie. We've put that in the chat and I'm going to put that um, here in the chat. It's GW Frankie and his website is helpabee.org. Um, and the one last question is, what's the situation with California native buckeye and European honeybees? Do the blossoms harm these honey, um, these bees? Yeah, that's a big question, and never nobody's ever really fully um, researched it. For example, we know that the pollen uh, is 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 uh, toxic to honeybees. Uh, we we don't know what effect it has on native bees, but we do see a lot of native bees using the pollen. So this is something that somebody needs at some point to study. We don't know. Well, that answered two questions from people, and um, um, I can't help but just take this last one. So we had in our garden a lot of black-tailed bumblebees in the springtime and a few yellow-faced bumblebees. Now I only see a lot of yellow-faced bumblebees, but no black tail. Uh, what could be the reason for that? Uh, good question. I, uh, it's hard to answer that question without having seen that progression through time. Maybe that person then could email you directly about that. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Usually, what I do is I ask people to send me more information, yeah. and then I can give a better a better answer because there could be any number of reasons why this happens. Uh, could be that the the, the yellow faced bees are you know they stay around for a while they'll be they'll be declining as well through time as they do, uh, and then they'll pick up again in springtime next year. But the other bees, it could be that they've come into contact with some pesticides or who knows for sure. Um, so we'll end it there. I think we've gotten lots of good. Uh, there was a last minute question. Will the bees nest in clay soil? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. In fact, there's a, there's a real common sweat bee that, that nests in clay soil. They seem to like that clay soil and, and they... They can find their way into that into that soil. I don't know how they do it. They're well. They're they're very industrious. They figure out ways to get into it. There's some there's some nesting bees at the Oxford track there in UC at UC Berkeley that we always watch every year. And they're in the they're in this really bad soil. They go into it. They they manage to deal with it. Some bees, as I mentioned earlier, can deal with that kind of soil by taking water. They they take up a big drink of water someplace, and they spit it out on the soil. And makes it makes it softer. Then they scratch it out until they finally they go back and forth until they get enough water to make a hole. Well, Margaret Copeland's actually asked, and she's still on. She's asked two questions about um, one: what plants do ultra green sweat bees like? And then she asks about the importance of native bees to commercial agriculture in California. So two different questions. But um, is there a particular plant that the sweat bees like in addition to clay? <laughs> Well, um, you know, calendrinia is really a great plant for sweat bees. They like that. Yeah. I can also tell you that they like um, gum flower, grindelia. This is a really good one. 
uh, Encelia californica, which is the California bush sunflower, a really good, good one. There are others as well. If they, if they can always write to me and I can always refer you to, to our list that we've developed in this, this um, really handy flip card booklet where we talk about the bees and the plants that they like. So we can also, we can figure out, I mean, you know, three, four, five, six different kinds of plants that they like. <laughs> and the calendrini, I mean, I think this is one of the most, the neatest plants. Furthermore, it's a good idea to watch these plants and see what time of the day they actually are active because calendrini is, is a really good plant early in the morning. As the day goes on, most of the pollen and nectar are, are have already been taken. So you won't find bees all day long, even though the flower is still open. So this is this is calls upon you to make observations. I mean, bird watchers should be good at this. There are such things as bee watchers, and we have a, a phenomena we call. Um, all my students have to learn how to do what we call getting their bee eyes, watching bees, and getting used to what they're doing. And once you get your bee eyes, you don't make mistakes. You don't go out there late in the afternoon when everything is hot and everything is dry and dusty, you go out there in the morning when the bees are there. That's getting your bee eyes. And birders know this. Birders should be good bee, bee people. Um, Margaret had a bigger question about the native bees to commercial agriculture. How, how important are they in, in California to um, commercial agriculture? Well, I think I need to write somebody. This is a complicated question because it's evolving right now it's be, it's becoming very aware in fact that's how we started with our, all our intensive work with bees and that is that um, high, honey bees are declining and they continue to decline and uh, like a lot of things but um, we got into the alternate um, alternates to, to native uh, to honey bees with our na solitary bee work and we continue to work on that and others do as well but we just don't know enough about native bees to know exactly how to manage them. There's a few species that we can manage because we know where they nest, but there's so many others that we don't know much about. And that's where all, a lot of effort is being going into now. There's just so many people studying bees, which is a really good thing. Yeah. I mean, we have 1600 species of bees. Can you imagine 1600 profiles of bees? No, we, we, it's gonna be years before we know. We only have a handful that we can tell you something about right now. And the, why are wool carter bees called that? Oh, well, you know, this is going to go on for a while. <laughs> I know. I can't help it, but well, that's the last one I'll take. <laughs> wool carter bee is interesting because there are certain plants like um, that have fine hairs on the, on, the, on the leaves and on the stems. And these bees come along and they actually pull those hairs off and they gather them up and they use them to nest. And that's why they're called wool carter bees, because they nest in these woolly, they take the woolly hairs off of flowers. There's, there's, a, there's a flower now that's in flower, I forgot the name of this plant. plant. It's, um, anyway, you can, watch, you can watch them actually scrape the, the, the hairs off the leaves and off the stems, and they'll carry them away, and they use them to make nests. Mm -hmm. That's why they're called wool, wool carter bees. Just an introduction. Well, I think we'll have to close it up. Somebody asked how to buy the bee flip book. You can email Dr. Frankie at gwfrankbee at berkeley.edu to get information about that. It's with the UCANR um, department at, um, at UC Davis. And um, we want to thank um, Belmont Village again and Jackie for hosting us today and for Dr. Frankie for staying over um, and uh, um, and answering all of our questions, um, which have been fascinating. You're right, it is one of the more fun parts. And Rosemary has put a link in the chat to the catalog, um, ANRC, ANRCA catalog uh, to get that flip book. And everyone is giving you tons of kudos. That was wonderful, beautiful slides, great, great presentation. I guess what I should probably say is that I want to call attention to the all the beautiful bee photos were done by Dr. Rollin Coville. Um, he's an outstanding um, entomologist and photographer. He's a wasp guy. He's a bee guy. And he just loves to photograph insects. And he's just produced some of the most beautiful insect photographs. And if anybody needs to use one of those photographs for any any useful purpose, 
you can write to him um, directly and um, and inquire to see if you can use maybe one of his images for a, a publication for the you know for the good of people. <laughs> Beautiful.